Thank you. Well, I want to thank uh, Steve Ellswick and the crew from uh, Exotic Research for the opportunity to make this presentation. And I want to thank the audience for your interest. Uh, this should be fun, and uh, hopefully it'll be informative also. I'm going to try and go through this fairly rapidly because of the time to allow time for questions. And uh, I think that I think it'll flow OK. Basically, I'm going to talk. Could I have the uh, few foils, please? I'm going to give a brief history of Stirling engines. And some people may already be familiar with this, but we'll go through it quickly for the people who may not be. And then I'll get into some technical description. Now, I am not a theorist. I'm uh, basically a machine designer. I'm nuts and bolts type person. And so there won't be much theory in that. But there will be quite a bit of explanation of how these engines work and some of the differences. There are various ways to achieve this and uh, what some of the differences are and uh, how that's implemented. We have uh, the announcement of the history. We've got a couple of sayings in the Stirling, in in the Stirling engine industry. Uh, one is that we're, we're preaching the gospel of the Reverend Robert Stirling. He was a minister in Scotland in uh, the early 1800s. He was ordained in 1816, and uh, at the same time, he filed for his patent on an economizer, which improved the air engine at the same time. So obviously, while he was going to school, the ministry school, he was also working on engines and, and technical things, even though there's no record of him ever having taken any technical classes. And uh, late, in later years, he worked with his brother James, who was an engineer, and uh, has been named on several other patents related to these engines. The air engine, as it was known at the time, already existed. Uh, this is a, a drawing from a patent, uh, the Mead engine, which is a hot gas engine. And uh, let me get my pointer out. Maybe I can help here. This, this engine is uh, a lot like a trombone in that there are two sections that slide. This top section fits into the bottom section, and uh, either the bottom or the top slides up and down during operation. And it's a closed volume of air this, uh, with a seal at the bottom at this rod. And this device inside was called a transfer. Uh, later on in Stirling engines, it's called a displacer. And how this operated was that you would heat this end of the engine and cool this end of the engine. And then as the transfer moved back and forth, it moved the air. This air in the space would be moved from the cot end to the cold end as the transfer moved. And when the air was moved, say the transfer would move to the cold end, the air would be heated in this end. Oh, oh very good. Thank you. OK, let me get used to this now. So if the air is at the hot end, the internal pressure would go up, and it would force the two sections apart. And then uh, as, it, as it, the transfer would be moved to the other end, the air would be forced to the cold end, the pressure would go down, and the parts could come back together. And these simple engines had been around for quite a few years, but they weren't very efficient, they weren't very powerful, and there was no practical use for them. What uh, the Reverend Sterling did was he invented the economizer. He called it the economizer. Uh, later, it's been called a regenerator. And what that did, if you look at this diagram, this is the displacer. And this is upside down from the previous in that the hot end is at the bottom and the cold end is at the top. And this displacer moves in this cylinder up and down. But as the gas flows from one end to the other, it goes through this economizer. And these were usually flat plates. They were either steel or glass. A lot of different materials were tried. And uh, the uh, plates or the material that was in the economizer stored energy from the gas as it went through. And uh, the, the hot gas coming through would heat these plates as it flowed through. And the air would come out at a lower temperature than it went in. 
Then as the gas was returning, it would, be, it would absorb heat from the economizer, and this saved, saved uh, fuel for these engines, made them practical, and several engines were built and used in factories or in mines for pumping water. This, uh, these engines were fairly large. They were large and they weren't very powerful. Uh, this shows the relative size of one of these engines uh, compared to people at the time. They, uh, I don't know what the horsepower rating of this might have been. It may have been one or two. I doubt if it was more than five. And uh, they, they tended to be fairly large engines. There are only two known Stirling engines in existence right now, and these were two models, two models that, uh, that he made for uh, the universities at the time. I guess they were used for research, and uh, one right now is at the Royal Scottish Museum, and the other is at Glasgow. That will skip that one. Here's an example of some engines that were built in the 1800s. And it shows some of the relative sizes. These are Ericsson engines. Uh, John Ericsson was famous uh, for building engines and ships and, and doing a lot of things that uh, uh, we still hear about these days. And this shows how the, the, the relative sizes of the engines that were offered. This is an engine that uh, was shown last year at a show in Washington that I saw. There are uh, quite a few of these still around being uh, shown by people. Uh, Jim, how many would you say? A couple of dozen in the country? Yeah, there's probably a couple of dozen existing in the country right now. And uh, so they're still around and they're still operating. This is an engine, a uh, Lehmann engine. This was at Germany at the uh, Deutsche Museum in Munich. And uh, that's me standing there next to it. And it shows the, the sizes of some of these engines and how elaborate the brickwork was to supply the heat for the hot end. They burn these solid fuels. This engine uh, is one of the first modern engines. Uh, the Phillips Company started uh, working with uh, Stirling engines in the 30s, in the late 30s. Uh, they were uh, building uh, radios and electronic systems, and they needed a way to charge batteries. These were all vacuum tube radios and systems. And to charge the batteries, they wanted an engine that didn't have ignition noise that could operate on multiple types of fuel and would also be quiet audibly so it didn't uh, uh, drown out the radio. And they did a study and decided that the Stirling engine would be the, the ideal engine for that application. And so they started doing research and building engines. And they really were the originators of the modern high-speed Stirling engines. And in fact, they also coined the name Stirling engine uh, for these because uh, in the past, usually these engines were charged with air, and they were called hot air engines or air engines. And uh, Phillips started working using helium and hydrogen. And with these gases, they really didn't feel right calling them hot air engines. And they decided to call them Stirling engines because it worked on the Stirling principle. This is another engine. This engine was developed in the late 60s uh, for the Army, the U.S. Army by General Motors. Uh, GPU stands for Ground Power Unit. This was a three kilowatt generator set and uh, it was successful. It was supposed to be inaudible at 500 yards and generate electricity from jet fuel. We get into some of, the, some of the theory now and some of the different types of engines and I'll go over this briefly and if you have some questions, go ahead and ask them. But if there get to be too many questions, maybe we'll save them for the end and we can go back and, and talk about it in more detail or individually. This is the traditional description uh, that you get in physics or, or in engineering books about how the cycle works. And uh, it's not necessarily what I consider the best. Uh, basically, basically what you have, you have two pistons there's a piston here on the compression side, and this side of the, of the cylinder is always kept at the cold temperature, T minimum. You have a regenerator between the two, and then you have the hot side, which is the expansion side. And if you look at the diagram here, this is a PV diagram, which is used to measure the energy, uh, either used or, or, or given up by the engine. 
and uh, the energy measured is the area enclosed by the curve. And what you have is energy, the pressure times the volume gives you the energy per cycle, and then the number of cycles, depending on how fast the engine is running, actually gives the power. So the faster an engine runs, even if it has the same uh, swept volume, the pressure of the PV value will produce more power than a slower engine. And uh, if we look at going from state one to state two here, we're starting out at a given volume, and we're reducing that volume, and at the same time, increasing the pressure. And that's what happens going from this state to this state. You can see this piston moves in, the other piston is stationary, and so the volume, the volume between the pistons is reduced. And at this time, the pressure goes up slightly. Going from state two, two to state three, we move both pistons, so the volume stays constant. And as it moves through, we're going from the cold side to the hot side, and it's absorbing energy from the regenerator. This is assuming that the temperatures have already stabilized at the, at the hot and cold temperatures. And we get to state three here. We have a, a pressure and a volume here at state three, which is represented by this part of the diagram. And going from state three to state four, we increase the volume. And that's where the piston moves out. And uh, that's shown here. This piston is moving out, which increases the volume enclosed in the engine, whereas this piston stays stationary. And then we go back from state four to state one by moving both pistons to the right, which get, brings us back to this. And that's basically what is being done uh, every revolution. And I'm not sure that that's really a good explanation or, or not, the, not the easiest to understand, but we'll try to rectify that. Do you envision a closed can with a pressure gauge on it, if, if, this, if this can is cold or at room temperature when the gauge is installed, it'll read a low pressure. If you heat the can, the pressure will go up. And that's basically how this, how this works, basically by heating and cooling a closed volume of gas. In that can, we'll add a displacer. So now we have a displacer in the can there's a seal at this end and a rod that comes through that can move this displacer back and forth. When the displacer is over at the hot end, we're also going to heat one end of the cylinder and we're going to cool the other end continuously. It's not a matter of heating it and letting it cool down or vice versa. This is continuously heated on this end and continuously cooled here. If the displacer is at the hot end, the air that's inside the engine is at the cold end and the pressure is low. If we move the displacer back to the other end, it forces the air to the hot end, and that increases the pressure. If we add a power piston to this system, we have the same cylinder with a displacer in it. Now we put a passageway over to a piston and some mechanism here. This mechanism right now is undefined. We'll get into that later. With this piston here, that's what actually does the work and, and produces the energy, that's that the mechanical energy from this heat energy. Here with the displacer over at the hot end, the pressure is low and the piston is at top dead center. Another requirement of these engine is that the motion of the displacer is 90 degrees ahead of the piston, uh, 90 degrees in rotation ahead of the piston at all times, and uh, that puts everything in the proper phase as far as the pressure wave versus the position of the piston. So we start out at low pressure with the piston at this end, and we move the displacer to the cold end, which increases the internal pressure, and that internal pressure forces the piston out. And as the piston moves out, it operates this mechanism, which forces the displacer back to the other end. And as it comes back to the other end, it cools the gas, lowers the pressure, and returns the piston to this end. A way to increase the power output and the efficiency of these engines 
or at least to increase the, the heat transfer from outside into the working gas space would be instead of letting the gas flow past the displacer in every, in every movement of the displacer, you put passageways outside. So as the displacer moves back and forth, we've added a seal to the displacer, and as the displacer moves back and forth, it forces the gas through this passageway, oscillating flow through this passageway. And then on this passageway, you put a heater here, and you heat the gas as it flows through, and you put a cooler here and cool it as it flows through the cooler section. And the same thing happens as far as the pressures and the motion of the piston. What Robert, what Robert Sterling did to increase the efficiency of these engines was to add the regenerator. And the regener regenerator is added in this passageway between the heater and the cooler. And what that does is as the hot gas flows through, it heats that regenerator. It gives up heat to the metal in the regenerator and cools so that when it gets to the cold side, it's already given up a lot of that energy and is already cooler before it goes through the cooler. Then coming back the other way, passing through the cooler, and enters the regenerator, and it takes back heat because it's now colder than the, than the regenerator is, and when it exits the regenerator, it's taken back the heat that it lost going through the first time. And this is repeated every, every cycle, and uh, regenerator efficiencies are on the order of 97 percent, 95, 97 percent efficient. And that is really what made these engines practical. We'll get into some of the different types of engines now. This engine, this engine is called an alpha type engine. And it's basically similar to the diagram that I showed that showed the basic theory of these engines, except what's happened now is instead of the two pistons facing each other, they've been rotated around 90 degrees, so they're parallel to each other, and that makes the mechanism, uh, it makes a simpler mechanism to operate both. And this is uh, one of the original or one of the simplest forms of this engine. This engine is called a gamma type. Uh, these, these names uh, are fairly arbitrary. They were developed by Graham Walker at the University of Calgary, and uh, he's retired right now, but for years he's, he's written many books about Stirling engines, and he's been an authority and, and taught many classes. I've taken a couple of classes from him. This is the gamma type engine, and uh, it is the engine as I showed earlier, with a displacer cylinder and a power piston cylinder, two separate cylinders, and the heater, the cooler, and the regenerator are off to the side here. And this, again, has a mechanism that keeps the displacer and, and the uh, power piston in the correct phase. This engine is called a beta type, and what's done here is both the displacer and the power piston are put into the same cylinder. And there's a rod, the rod that runs the displacer runs through the center of the piston, and there's another seal here to seal that rod. And so we have a, a mechanism here that drives both the piston and the displacer in the same cylinder. And again, we have the heater, cooler, and regenerator off to the side as the other engines had. This, this engine type is what I have here. This is my engine type. Uh, I like it. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly compact design, and it also has some other advantages in that dead volume, which is, which is volumes of gas that are not swept by the pistons, that are not swept volumes, are minimized, and this helps to increase the compression ratio. Now, a way to increase the power output of some of these engines would be to have multi-cylinders. And rather than having several engines together, you'd build one engine with multiple cylinders. And there's an efficiency of components in that. If you look at this, is called a Franco engine or Franco-type engine. 
it's basically two alpha type engines. Here's one alpha engine here with a heater, cooler, and regenerator and two pistons. Then here's another alpha engine here. It's got a heater, cooler, and regenerator and the same two pistons. So it, it's two engines that are sharing pistons. It eliminates two of the pistons from if you had used two engines, separate en engines. So it gives a, a higher output than two engines would because you have lower friction. You have uh, less, fewer seals. You have half the number of seals you'd need and a uh, simpler mechanism. You only have one mechanism and not two. The disadvantage with this engine is that one of these, one of these alpha engines, this one here, has the heater on the same end as the seals. So that complicates the design of the seals and reduces life and, and, and can be a problem. One solution of that is the Siemens engine. Again, we have two alpha engines. This is one alpha engine here. And then the other alpha engine is this, this one here. But what we've done now is we've taken the cooler here through the regenerator and the heater over to the next engine this way. And then the cooler end of this engine goes through the regenerator heater and then back to the first cylinder. And this time we have all of the seals are located on the cold end and this helps to reduce the wear and tear on seals. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the mechanisms to, to achieve this. And this, by no means, is a complete list of the mechanisms. One of the simplest is the crank mechanism. You have a, a, a crankshaft. This, this crank or this throw operates the displacer. This one runs the piston. And there's a 90 degree phase lag between the two. If, if rotation is in this direction, you can see that the displacer here is at bottom dead center and the piston is on its way down. It's 90 degrees away from bottom dead center. This is a rhombic mechanism. Rhombic mechanism is what I use in my engine and that's why the crankcase is so wide. There are two crankshafts in there and there are gears that aren't shown in this diagram that keep the crankshafts operating 180 degrees out of phase. The crankshafts have four sets of connecting rods. This pair of connecting rods, the top pair, are attached to the piston, the power piston. The bottom connecting rods run this rod that runs up through the power piston to the displacer. And although it doesn't seem like it when you first look at the diagram, there is a phase difference between these two objects and uh, as the, as the engine rotates around, it keeps them in the proper relationship. Uh, the, the phase difference on my engine is approximately 120 degrees, not 90 degrees. Uh, the theoretical ideal is 90 degrees, and there are various reasons why sometimes you don't use that. Uh, this is not intentional here. I haven't done a study to try and optimize the phase angle here. It's just that some engines, uh, I think it's due to gas flow and the time that it takes the gas for gas to flow uh, from the hot end to the cold end through the regenerator has to be accounted for somewhere, whereas in the ideal engine it's assumed to be instantaneous. It isn't, and I think that's why some of these phase relationships stray from 90 degrees. And that's, that's a whole other area of study to just figure out why that is. This mechanism is called the Ross yoke. And, uh, in this engine, it's showing how you can convert the rotary motion of the crankshaft here to nearly linear motion on the compressor or the displacer and the power piston with this, with this triangular piece and a link that holds that keeps the triangular piece in position. And as the crank rotates, this triangular piece translates up and down, but it also rotates at the same time. And as it rotates, it moves these connecting rods and pistons up and down and uh, operates the engine in the, in the proper phase. I mentioned earlier that air was used in helium and hydrogen. 
This, com this is a comparison of the performance, uh, namely the efficiency on this chart anyway, uh, of different engines with, uh, it's, well it's one engine with different fluids, with, uh, with different charges. This is air, this is helium, this is hydrogen. Uh, the dotted line there is a calculated value for carbon dioxide. And uh, the, the chart basically shows, shows what you can expect with these different gases. If you look here at, uh, let's say, 35, uh, at, a, at an engine that's running at 35% efficiency and compare the different gases, you'll see that the air engine here is producing, down at this axis we have power density or, or horsepower per liter. You can see the, that the horsepower per liter here is on the order of five. I guess that's 10. I'm having trouble reading that from here. Yeah, this is, this is 20, so that's 10. If you look at the helium, we're up here. This is about 50, 45, or 50 horsepower per liter, and the hydrogen is way over 60. And that's, that's quite a difference if you look at the performance in these different gases. Uh, I, in our engines, we're using air mainly because we want these engines to be household appliances, and so we don't expect people to have bottles of hydrogen and helium around to try and keep them charged. Also, there's difficulty with the, the hydrogen and helium containing them. They tend to leak out a lot faster than air does. Uh, air is readily available, and the engine can be charged with uh, a bicycle pump. Comparing the output torque of an engine, uh, this is an auto cycle engine and this is a Stirling engine. They're both four cylinder engines. This is a four stroke, four cylinder engine and this is a Stirling engine, a four cylinder Stirling engine. And the, the, the torque output on this auto engine, you can see that it varies in one revolution. This is 360 degrees of crankshaft rotation. It varies wildly and it even goes negative on certain parts of the stroke uh, when it's intaking. It's actually using power rather than delivering power or torque. The Stirling engine is positive the whole way, even though there is some wavering there. It's a lot smoother and that's a, a lot less wear and tear on the engine and engine components and also leads to reduced noise. That's why these engines run a lot quieter than, than the gasoline engines. This is a comparison, basically an energy, uh, an energy balance comparison, but it shows how the efficiency uh, of a Stirling engine compares with a diesel engine. And these engines are roughly the same size. This is a, a 60 kilowatt diesel engine. This is a 50 kilowatt Stirling engine. And uh, what I've done is I've taken the fuel input and I've called that 100% in each case. So we're saying that the energy put in, in each case is 100%, and then looking at how it divides out in, in the different functions in the engine. So if you look at the exhaust here, you'll see that 14% of the Stirling engine energy goes out through the exhaust, and it's 34% on the diesel engine. Uh, this, there are techniques that are used in a Stirling engine to reduce the heat loss. Uh, some of it is used to preheat the incoming combustion air, and, uh, and so that energy is recovered from the exhaust that way. If we look at the radiator and oil cooler heat losses, we see that the Stirling engine is considerably more than the diesel engine is. Uh, that's uh, uh, a nature of these engines, and that's why when you see some Stirling engines used, especially in automotive applications, the radiators are much larger than they would be for a comparable diesel or gasoline engine. If you Yes, it is. Uh, the question, yes, the question is, has this been optimized? And to the best of my knowledge, these two engines are really, they're, they're highly, highly developed engines, and, and uh, they would include that, yeah. Uh, figures I've heard for uh, recirculating, uh, not recirculating, but preheating the incoming air is that it, it can be a gain of up to 7% in efficiency. No, I think this, this includes that 7%. This, this is with, uh, 
with preheat. And uh, the, uh, the losses are comparable here for uh, thermal losses. That would be the conduction and, and convection of uh, just to the outside air around the engine. Mechanical friction losses are comparable. And if you look at the brake power output, they also uh, are fairly comparable. Uh, and that shows that you can, you can roughly estimate these engines to be comparable in efficiency with, with diesel engines. And uh, also, weight-wise, I think they tend to compare well with, with diesel engines. They tend to be heavier than gasoline engines for the equivalent power. Back in the 60s, the Winnebago company was looking at uh, using a, a Stirling engine for uh, power on their mobile homes or their, or their recreational vehicles. And they did a study uh, comparing uh, auto cycle engine with uh, a Stirling engine. This was a, an 8 kilowatt Stirling engine. I believe it came from Europe. I, think it, I don't know if it was Swedish or, or who made it. Uh, this is uh, just comparing the maintenance what it would take to keep this thing running and what the customer would have to do. And uh, you look here, uh, check oil. Uh, you don't need to check the oil on the Stirling engine because it's a sealed system. Uh, it's a lot like a compressor in that you never see, the, the oil never sees any combustion products because there's no combustion inside. So it stays clean. Uh, you, you never have to change the oil. Uh, oil filter, you never change an oil filter. There are no spark plugs. There is an igniter. It shows down here that every 2,000 hours they estimated you'd have to change the igniter. Uh, this, uh, I'm not sure what the fuel was for this engine. It was probably either gasoline or, or propane. And uh, it was a helium charged one, so they estimated that every 2,000 hours you'd have to change a, a, a helium bottle. But if you compare that with the, the amount of work that it would take to maintain an equivalent auto cycle engine, it looks like this would be a lot simpler thing to operate. This is another Winnebago uh, comparison. This is comparing the sound levels. One of the advantages of the, of the Stirling engine uh, is that they are quiet. And uh, this is comparing the same two engines again and uh, the, the sound output. This is one meter from the source outside of the vehicle, and we're showing 55 dB on the engine and uh, on the Stirling and, and 80 on the auto cycle. And it's hard to relate what those numbers are, so I've added a chart here. And I'm not sure if you can read that chart, but it shows here that uh, looking at what these numbers are, uh, 80 dB is an average orchestra or, or a very loud radio. Uh, looking at this, uh, 55, 55 is between 50 and 60 here. 50 is softly spoken words, and 60 is normal conversation. So this is outside of the vehicle one meter away, and that's, that's quite a bit quieter than the auto cycle engine. Uh, inside the vehicle, there's not that much difference, but in every case, the Stirling engine is still quieter. Another advantage of a Stirling engine is the versatility. Uh, there are a number of different functions that they can perform, uh, and that's the same engine can perform all of these functions uh, with no mechanical changes. Now, it may be designed to be optimized to do one particular thing, but it can still do the others to a certain degree. This shows a traditional Stirling engine, a, a hot gas engine, you might want to call it. Here is the hot end. This is where the heater is. This is the cooler, the cold end, and the regenerator is between them. You put heat in to the hot end. You take heat out at the cold end at the cooler, and you get mechanical work out or power out. And we're going to define this counterclockwise rotation as being the forward direction for this discussion and uh, see how this compares with the other functions. So this is an engine which you apply heat, you burn a fuel or supply heat somehow, and you get mechanical energy out.
here we can operate that same engine as a refrigerator, rotating in the forward direction, but this time we put a motor here and we put power in instead of taking power out. So we rotate the engine in the same direction it would run as if it was used as a hot gas engine. This end becomes cold, this end becomes hot, and because it gets hot you can take heat out here and the cold end will take heat in and it'll cool something. Uh, these, are, these are used to a large extent for making liquid air. They'll actually get that cold and uh, this engine that I've got here, even with an air charge, I've had it down to 14 degrees Fahrenheit by running it with this motor and uh, it, finally, it finally stopped running and I think the reason it did was that the air inside had enough moisture that it froze inside and seized the piston or, or seized the displacer and uh, that locked everything up but it got down to 14 degrees fairly rapidly and uh, the outside was covered with frost. They're not as efficient uh, I would say, oh the question is how efficient are they as refrigerators? They're not as efficient because generally uh, I think refrigerators don't tend to be as efficient and when you start getting into these colder temperatures, when they're especially going down to liquid nitrogen or, or, or colder temperatures, you get a lot of heat losses just from conduction or from the surroundings. Things have to be well insulated and uh, some of the, uh, oh, some of the systems that I worked with uh, they're talking about things like two, uh, 50 watts per watt uh, of, you know, uh, 50 watts of energy input to get two watts of cooling out, things like that. So that's about 4% efficient. Uh, there's, there's some, well, there's, no, they're not as efficient as what we use now. The advantages for using for a household refrigerator is that you could use helium or air or some other gas as the refrigerating gas and uh, get away from the, the uh, polluting gases, but they're not as efficient at those higher temperatures. Those are considered fairly high temperatures. When you start getting into the colder temperatures, then the efficiency of the Stirling engine is better than some of the other ways of doing the same thing. And that's, and that's where the real advantage is. But at the same time, even though they're less efficient, uh, I've heard of applications where, for example, I think it's in Japan, uh, they're using or they're designing refrigerators for supermarkets using Sterling refrigerators. And uh, part of the reason, I think, is for some reason they, they cool their food colder. And uh, there may be an advantage there to using the Sterling engine because then maybe the efficiency is higher uh, when it's colder. Did that answer your question? Okay. Okay, this is, uh, this is a cold gas engine. A again, it's the same physical engine, the same components, but this time you cool, cool this end all right, by removing heat from it, uh, you could do that by placing ice on it or, or some other mechanism that would remove heat. And then you'd add heat to this end, which is now becomes the hot end. And what happens then is that the engine runs in the reverse direction. And it'll, it'll give you power output, but it'll run the, in the opposite direction. And uh, Stirling engines can also be used for heat pumps. This is the same engine again. This time we're running it in the reverse direction, putting power in and running it reverse. And what it'll do is it'll take heat from the cold end and actually pump heat out to the hot end. And it's basically, you can you could consider it, say for example, you had a water cool jacket here and this water cool jacket was at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 60 degrees Fahrenheit you're actually taking heat, there is heat in that water, and you're taking the heat from that water and cooling it and, take, and transferring that heat to this end and actually heating this end. And uh, that uh, works again with the same mechanism that was used for the engine and the refrigerators. 
I've got a list here of some applications that uh, you may or may not be aware, aware of. These are two generator sets. This is the GPU3 again, and this is the Philips engine. These are our gener uh, electrical power generators. There's a lot of interest right now in cogeneration and in emergency power and a lot of people who want to be off the grid completely. Uh, because the Stirling engine is a multi-fuel engine in that uh, you need to heat the hot end, it doesn't really care where that heat comes from. Uh, things like wood can be used. Uh, I've talked with people from the Midwest, from Iowa specifically, who say that uh, corn, uh, heating with corn is cheaper than using wood pellets there because they've got an abundance of corn and the heating value in the corn is higher than the wood. Uh, there's uh, solar applications. I'm working with someone now who's building a solar collector and we're going to put uh, my engine up on a solar collector here hopefully this year and uh, see if we can generate some power that way. So the, the electrical power generation, at least from the, the people that I talk to, is probably the greatest demand right now. You know, people want to use them. They want them on their recreational vehicles. They want one in the basement in case the lights go off. Uh, the, the computer, the server that I use for my internet, for my web page, uh, we had power go out for a couple of days last year, or the year before, I guess it was, and he told me that if he had a 500 watt generator, he could still be online because the phone lines were still up. And his emergency power lasted for 20 minutes. And after that, he was down for two days. But he could have still serviced his customers with as little as 500 watts. Uh, the engine could have been hooked to a natural gas line in the basement. He could have gone down, started it, and had his electrical power and never missed a beat. This is what's called a low-tech engine. This uh, Photon company is a company in Germany. I'm not sure if they're still building these, but it's what's called a flat plate engine. This is, a, this is the displacer, and this, and this, is, the, uh, this is the hot end. It's, a, it's a, 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 a transparent or a plastic plate. It has bolts down the center to, uh, to help stiffen it, uh, ties it front to back. And there's a foam plastic in there which acts as a displacer. The mechanism is underneath and the power piston and this by sun shining on this side and they've got water flowing on the back side for the cold end this generates about 500 watts uh, from the sun the, on this day it was an overcast day and that was still running and it was pumping water through these hoses out into a pond pardon oh okay I didn't I guess I didn't bring any pictures they had about four different models, and I've got another uh, slide here somewhere that shows, I didn't repeat the question. Uh, uh, okay, the question is, how does a mechanism on this engine work? This mechanism was, it was basically a crank me mechanism underneath, and you can see the flywheel. Here's part of the flywheel here and the flywheel rotated in this direction on the back side and if I remember right this had a bellows for a power piston they had they had three or four different models here at this at this particular event and every one was different and they were pretty ingenious and, and they were basically made up of links and levers with uh, rod ends uh, for pivots and things like that so it was fairly simple I mentioned cogeneration earlier, and this is a schematic that we came up with for a project we were working on several years ago. And uh, this was a cogeneration system that was going to go in a house in Canada, in Toronto, Canada. It was going to generate electricity from wood pellets and hot water for the house, and uh, it was going to sit in the kitchen. So it was it had to be quiet. And that's why we got into the involved with the rhombic drive mechanism because it can be balanced and, and for, to eliminate vibration and uh, operate in the house with no problem. Uh, what we were going to do is the unit itself would be a rectangular box uh, about the size of a coffee table that would sit near the wall. The wood pellets would be outside and there was an auger that would go through the wall to supply pellets to the stove 
and then the exhaust would go back through the same wall up above the pellet bin. And uh, this shows some of the major components here schematically. This is the engine, and it's upside down from what I was showing earlier. This is, this is where the heat comes in. This is the burner that burned the pellets, and the heat supplied to the engine went off. This is part of the heat that went to the cooler. This is part of the energy that went to the generator. This was the electrical power out. Uh, this was all of the losses that went out into the room, and the losses that went into the room weren't really losses because it was intended to heat the room itself, and that really boosted the efficiency of the whole system. Um, one of the problems that we found with this engine when we started doing the analysis, not so much with the engine but the system, was that by the time we ran this water, incoming water, through the engine and, and it came out at a certain temperature, it wasn't hot enough for what they wanted. And so we had to add another heating coil in here so heat from this burner would also add more heat to this water to raise the temperature to the temperature that they, they wanted uh, at their outlet. And uh, it looked like it was going to be a fairly, fairly nice little project, but they ran out of money and uh, that ended it. And that's really how Tayman Enterprises got started with Sterling Engine Development. This is an energy balance sheet for the same, for the same system. Uh, this is an earlier version. I, I copied the wrong one. If you look at the overall efficiency here, it says 89%. We actually got up as high as 97% by the time we were through with it. And this just shows how the different energies or different energy flows in the system divide out for different electrical outputs from 200 and, uh, 294 watts up to 882 watts of electrical output. It's one of the advantages of the cogeneration systems, especially if the heat is going to be used. Uh, the excess heat is that it runs the efficiency way up. I know of at least two projects that are involved with Sterling Powered Aircraft. And uh, there are, you don't really think about it at first, but there are quite a few advantages to that. Both of them are working with ultralight aircraft, mainly because of the, the regulations and things that would be required to, to get a, an engine uh, approved for, uh, for a regular aircraft. The, the regulations were a lot more lenient for, for ultralights. But some of the advantages are uh, fuels. You don't need to use gasoline, uh, and that's a safety issue also. Uh, things like jet fuel could be used, uh, almost anything. Uh, power, uh, as, the, uh, as the airplane goes to a higher altitude, the outside air temperature goes down, which is an advantage for a Sterling engine because you want the cooler to run as cold as possible. And uh, you look at a, an internal combustion engine, as it goes up higher, its, its power actually drops off because of the, the pressure drop. Uh, lower vibration uh, with a Sterling engine. It uh, is less stress on, on components and passengers. Uh, reliability, there are fewer moving parts, and show this, so there should be uh, uh, a higher reliability. Safety, lower fire danger, again, because of the fuel, uh, fuel used in the event of a crash. Uh, economy, it's a higher efficiency, and also there, aren't, there isn't a need for an oil change, and so you'll save the cost of that, and it's also a benefit for the ecology. And also quiet, that's an advantage both for the passengers or the people on board and for people on, gr on the ground. Uh, some of the disadvantages, are, and now these are uh, disadvantages that would, would relate to just engines in general. But with an aircraft engine, they're probably not as critical. Uh, the high cost, uh, people who deal with aircraft, you know, they're used to spending a lot of money. And so... It's not so much of a shock for them, I guess you could say. Uh, production volume, uh, right now, uh, Sterling engines haven't been produced in high volumes, not anything like the automotive industry or, or appliance industries. And uh, I did a study uh, a few years back looking at aircraft engine production in the United States. And uh, for single engine land air aircraft, and the numbers all oh, for the past Ten years before this, this was about five years ago, there were less than 500 engines per year produced in this country. And it was basically because engine production is down or almost non-existent at the time, and these engines were only being produced as replacements for existing aircraft. 
uh, and uh, uh, complication of operation. Uh, that's another argument that's given for Stirling engines or against Stirling engines. Uh, pilots tend to be technical people, or at least they understand and they're used to dealing with reading gauges and following complex instructions. So again, that advantage is not so much a disadvantage when you consider aircraft. Yes? Oh, the question is, uh, the weight would be a, a serious disadvantage. That is, and uh, I guess I missed that one. But that's very important. Yeah, that would be a disadvantage. So, uh, I think some of it can be engineered out. But basically, uh, the Stirling engine, it's a pressure vessel. And uh, by pressurizing it, you increase the power output. And the higher the pressure, the more power there is. Uh, the Phillips engines, they ran, uh, some of them with hydrogen, uh, 2 and 3,000 PSI. And so they were very heavy. Uh, my engines, I limit the pressure to 150 PSI because I figure that's what people are comfortable with, uh, just, you know, the average citizen. Uh, my logic or my motto is that anyone that can drive an automobile should be able to operate one of these engines. And uh, so I try to keep the pressure down that I pay a penalty for that in weight in that the engine has to be physically larger to achieve a given power, uh, where you, whereas you could do it with a smaller engine operating at a higher pressure. Uh, and also because, uh, as you remember in that chart that compared the different fluids, uh, uh, working fluids, uh, air is not a high performance fluid, and so you pay a weight penalty there also. In, in the size of the engine has to be larger to give an equivalent power uh, to an engine that would have helium or hydrogen. Uh, the other thing is that if someone really wanted a high performance engine to, uh, for some application, they could charge that with helium and, and its power input would go up quite a bit. Uh, I haven't tried it with my engine, but I know other engine builders who have and the comparison is pretty dramatic between air and, and helium. I would think that dry nitrogen would behave a lot like air because air is mainly is nitrogen. Uh, the advantage with using dry nitrogen, oh, well, the question was what about using dry nitrogen as a working fluid? And I think that uh, its performance would be similar to air. The advantage is that you wouldn't be ingesting moisture that comes with air that has to be removed somehow, uh, either removed or, or lived with somehow. And then also you wouldn't have the oxygen, which can be a problem with the lubricants, uh, if there are any lubricants in the engine uh, that could contaminate things and, and uh, react with the oxygen. There, there have been engine explosions because of that. And that, that would be the advantage of using nitrogen. And what about something like argon as a working fluid? People have tried that. I don't know much about it, but I have seen that referred to in some of the literature. Uh, argon has been used. Methane has been used, carbon dioxide has been used, and, these, and also mixtures of these gases. And I think that's something that's it's a whole area of study in itself. Uh, I, uh, what about refrigerants? I don't know of anyone who's tried any refrigerants. I, I haven't heard of, of that being done. You're welcome. Uh, this is an application uh, boat uh, powered with a Stirling engine. And uh, my friend Jim Tangeman, who is here now, he's got a boat with a Stirling engine on it, uh, or it had a Stirling engine until recently. And uh, that's the first Stirling powered boat that I ever rode in. And uh, it was pretty enjoyable. It's quiet, smooth, and you put along, and, and everybody looks and wonders what it is. And I think I misplaced the picture of your boat, unless it turns up in here somewhere by accident. This is a cogeneration system that's being developed in New Zealand. And uh, I've met the, the guy. He's got some patents on this. He's a professor at the uh, University of Christchurch in New Zealand. And uh, this is a co Well, it started out as being a, a power system for charging batteries on yachts. And it's a four-cylinder. It's a four-cylinder Stirling engine, Siemens-type engine here. This is the burner end and the cooler and the rest of the mechanism is, is here. 
This is packaged in a fiberglass enclosure. It's cut away here. It's shown cut away, but it's a very nice looking unit. And they're in the process of producing the first 200 units for, for research work. They've got several out being used as cogeneration systems in Europe. I don't know if there are any in the, in the United States right now, but they're looking for a manufacturer or someone who's willing to invest in, in uh, producing these. And it looks like a nice little system to me. It's got an electronic control box here where you can set, set time for turn on and turn off, and I'm not sure what else. It uh, produces about 750 watts of electricity and 500 kilowatts of hot water. This is one of Jim Tangerman's uh, creation, and this is uh, land power. And uh, although I didn't get to ride behind this particular tractor, I did get a ride on another one with a similar cart. And so, and that's the first vehicle I've ever ridden in that was propelled with a Stirling engine. I'm going to close right here. I've, I do have a whole stack of other pictures of different engines and things like this. And we can go into a question and answer session, or I can show some of these. And I'm sure there'll be other questions uh, raised from seeing these. Uh, that's. I'll just treat that as pretty open open time after this. Uh, some of the contradictions related to Sterling engines and the advantages and disadvantages, and the future. I'm not sure what the future is. Uh, uh, I think that cogeneration or combined heat and power is where the Sterling engine is really going to shine because of its efficiency and the fact that it uses multi fuels, and uh, especially the solid fuels, uh, uh, namely the wood. Uh, there's a lot of people interested in generating electricity using wood in various fashions. And things like natural gas, which is readily available, and in a lot of places it's fairly economical too. Uh, that, from my experience, is the greatest demand right now. I don't think automotive is a good application. These engines tend to want to be constant speed engines. The only reason that, uh, or the only application automotive would be possibly hybrid where the engine is operated at a constant speed to charge batteries, top off batteries, and extend the range of the vehicle. Some of the contradictions. Well, one major one is that the Stirling engine is a simple engine, and that uh, the Stirling engine is not a simple engine. It, it, it seems to depend a lot on what the application is. Uh, any, any application that requires rapid uh, speed changes uh, really complicates the engines. Uh, you can get into other complications uh, depending on what the accessories are or, or what the engine's actually going to do. Uh, my theory about things, uh, things mechanical in general is that as, as some system gets simpler, every component in it becomes more critical. And so when you look at the simplicity of a Stirling engine, you know, with it doesn't have the valves compared to a, a, an internal combustion engine. It doesn't have push rods and camshafts. It doesn't have an ignition system that has to be timed to, to fire at a, at a particular time. Uh, all of these things make it a lot simpler than, a, than an internal combustion engine. But at the same time, every component in there now becomes more important. And its performance is more critical to the overall system. And I think that's where one of these contradictions comes in. And the difference from one engine to another, as far as which engine is better, is uh, going to be how the designer and the manufacturer actually optimize these components to have them all play together and, and, and work. Disadvantages. These are some of the traditional, the traditional disadvantages. Oh, expense, uh, uh, the argument has been that they're expensive, and, and I guess they have been, and I think that's mainly because they've been produced in low volumes. And uh, so you have hand-built engines or, or engines that are made uh, without, without high production tooling or, or high production methods. And uh, my intent is to design an engine that will be produced in quantities of 10,000 units per year, and that would justify the additional tooling needed to actually mass produce engines. 
And the goal I've set for myself is to be able to produce a one kilowatt engine for a manufacturing cost, that's just to build the engine, of $250. And that's not, not going to be an easy thing to do, but I think it is doable if the volumes are high enough and uh, the right manufacturing processes are used and, and the right designs are, are made to, to, to make use of these high volume uses. Uh, mass is another disadvantage, and as pointed out earlier, that, that's a serious disadvantage, uh, especially for anything that's going to be mobile. Uh, if it's a stationary engine, it's probably not so much of a disadvantage, and uh, most of the applications that I see for these engines would be stationary engines. Uh, lifetime has been an issue in the past. Um, mainly, I think, or at least in the engines that I've worked with, it's the piston seal and possibly the bearings that are the major uh, lifetime issues. The other components are fairly, fairly well developed in, in, in fairly common things. Uh, the power output is very dependent on heat exchanger design, both the hot, hot end heat exchanger, the cold end heat exchanger, and the regenerator, but those shouldn't be lifetime issues. Uh, uh, well, I take that back. In, in some respects, the engines that we're designing, I'm using uh, what are called finned heat exchangers. Uh, larger engines tend to use uh, tubular heat exchangers because they need more surface area. All of the energy transfer in these engines in and out is generally through metallic walls and these heat exchangers is, is where the performance is actually developed and when you get into larger engines you can't get that uh, the needed the necessary surface area uh, with a fiend, a fiend heat exchanger, and so going the tubular heat exchangers is necessary, and that's a lifetime issue in that these tubular heat exchangers are large, and they have many welded or brazed joints, and there's thermal expansion, uh, differential expansion, and uneven heating. Uh, so these tend to drive up the cost of the engines and re reduce their reliability. Uh, disadvantage being a constant speed engine, that may or may not be a disadvantage depending on the application. And uh, Ralph Mayer, who invented the rhombic drive, which I used when he was at Phillips and later on founded Sterling Thermal Motors in Detroit, uh, someone asked him what, time, what he thought the major disadvantage uh, to Sterling engines was, and he said it was the existence of other engines. Some of the advantages, uh, multifunction, the refrigerators, it can be a cold gas engine, a heat engine, uh, uh, or a, a heat pump. Uh, efficiency is high. Theoretically, it's the highest uh, efficiency uh, attainable by a mechanical heat engine. Uh, how close you get to the actual efficiency is depends on how well it's designed and manufactured. Uh, it's a simple mechanism, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, fewer components than a gasoline engine. Uh, Multi-fuel. Uh, it leaves a lot of options for fuel, and because it's multi-fuel, you can have low emissions. Uh, it's also a quieter engine, and uh, it's got a relatively flat torque curve, and, and that helps uh, in at low speeds. You've got uh, a lot of torque. The torque carries on up through the speed range generally. It's fairly constant, and as, so therefore as the speed increases, the power output increases and uh, there's very low lubricant consumption because it's a sealed system. I'm going to talk some about my engines and uh, what's been going on. Uh, I use the acronym uh, TESE to describe our engines. That's Tayman Enterprises Sterling Engines and then there's a number afterwards which is kind of an arbitrary number but in general it relates to when they were originally conceived. And uh, TESC001 was the engine that was going to be used in that cogeneration system for the Toronto house. These are the calculated performance curves for that engine. That engine had a five inch bore and a stroke of a, a little over one and a half inches. And uh, it was going to produce one kilowatt, one kilowatt of, of uh, output power at about 1200 RPM. So that would be right about here with a charge pressure of about five atmospheres. 
and the efficiency of that engine over the speed range here up to 3,000 RPM varied quite a bit, but in the area that we were talking about running it, it was about 25% efficient, or it would have been 25% efficient if it was ever built. When that project died, I started with uh, Sterling engine TESC002, and this engine was a smaller version of TESC001 because we lost our customer and we were going to be self-funded. I decided to develop a smaller engine to keep the cost down, uh, the cost of manufacturing parts mainly. And uh, so this engine, the bore went from uh, five inches to two and three quarter inches. And uh, this engine first ran in June of 1994, uh, not in this version, but in a much cruder version. And uh, it just barely ran, but it was a thrill uh, to see it finally run. And uh, this is the latest version of it uh, here. And this, this particular version was assembled last Sunday and, and first ran last Sunday. And I haven't had a chance to measure any power output, but it's significantly more power than the previous engines had produced. Uh, the main thing that changed on this engine is the cooler. Uh, the cooler was completely redesigned, and, and uh, I've got the previous cooler here. At, I can show you after this meeting, and uh, you'll see that there's quite a bit of difference uh, in the coolers. Uh, the performance of these engines really depends on having a, a high temperature difference between the hot and the cold ends. And what was happening with the other cooler is that the temperature of the cooler was going up so fast that it couldn't keep the gas cold. And so the power output went way down. And, and in fact, I shut the engine down after a minute of running every time because I was afraid of damaging the piston seal uh, from overheating it. It would get up over 300 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, whereas the design is uh, for maximum around 200 degrees to try and stay under the boiling point of water. This shows that same engine with some of the accessories mounted. Uh, this is a little alternator uh, from a tractor that uh, I tried at one time. I might go back to that, but I'm thinking out loud here. It was a nice little, a nice little alternator. I'm going to zip through some of these because they're pretty much pictures of the same engine, just different configurations. This is a configuration with an electric heater. Uh, instead of the burner, there's an electric heating coil wound around the hot end here, and then it's insulated. This was used, uh, this was sent to Germany for a conference uh, to put on display and operate there. Um, and I didn't, w well, for one thing, it's difficult to ship things by air that have had propane in them. Uh, they, they don't like that. And so I removed the burner and put the electric heating element on there. And also it would be easier for people, I wasn't going to the conference myself, and it was easier to have someone else run an electric heater than, than to deal with a propane burner. And uh, also for testing, when it finally comes to endurance testing of this engine, it'll be done with an electric heater. It's, it'll be easier to measure the power input by measuring the watts put into the heater and uh, for energy calculations and efficiency calculations. These are the specifications for uh, TESC002, and uh, the calculations show us that we should be getting three quarters of a watt, uh, three quarters of a kilowatt at 3,000 RPM with it. Uh, previous versions of this engine have run at well over 3,000 RPM. This one has run so far at over 2,000 RPM, but I didn't get a power measurement at that time, and I don't know how much faster it would have gone. I th uh, that was just a development test to see how it was operating, and, and I, was, I was impressed with this operation. Uh, efficiency should be around 22%. Um, what else might be of interest on there? Yeah, that's, that's the general specifications that I'm working to right now for this engine. And these are the performance curve. Uh, again, this is all analysis, um, but it shows that at 3,000 RPM, we should be able to get your 750 watts here. This is with eight atmospheres of charge pressure. Uh, oh, this also relates, uh, this, this chart 
shows this engine, how it relates with a constant torque curve, too. The output power is uh, torque times the speed divided by a constant. And if you look at this, this power curve is almost a straight line, which is showing that the power increases linearly with the speed, which means that the torque must be constant. And uh, I was happy to see that, too. And, and uh, I'm hoping to be able to, to replicate that with test data. This shows some of the internal components. This is the displacer. This has got a long displacer. It's over seven inches long. This, this particular displacer is made of stainless steel. This is the seal at the bottom of that displacer. And then here's the power piston. It's a little flat aluminum piston with an O-ring seal on it. This is the, the rhombic, this is the crankcase, the rhombic drive mechanism. You can see the two, these are the two connecting rods for the displacer and the end of the crank pins. It's a cantilever type crankshaft. It's got needle roller bearings on the, on the uh, crank pin end and uh, ball bearings uh, for the main bearings. There are two ball bearings on each crankshaft. This is the cooler that I just removed. This is an air-cooled cooler. This is an insert which is pressed into the outer part. The insert, it's difficult to see right here, but you'll see it on the actual parts, has 200 grooves all the way around. And these 200 grooves, this is the air passageway for the air that comes from the regenerator and goes down to above the piston. The regenerator sits on top of these grooves and the heater sits on top of the regenerator. And then the outer shell here, this was the air-cooled outer shell and it just didn't have enough cooling capacity to keep the, uh, the internal gas cold. This is a dynamometer that I built for that engine. It's basically a cradled generator with, a, with an arm on it and uh, the force is being read by a digital scale and the moment arm here, from the moment arm and the force, you can calculate the torque uh, the tachometer here is an optical sensor reading a perforated disc to get the speed. And I'm still working out the details on this dynamometer so that I can use it for measuring power. This is another picture of the same thing. This is the schematic diagram of uh, TESC-004. And it's similar to uh, 002. It has the same bore, two and three quarter inches. has a slightly longer stroke, so it has more swept volume and should produce a little more power. Uh, one of the changes that are made with this engine is on TESC 002, the rhombic drive mechanism, in theory, can be balanced 100%, so there's no vibration in any direction. The problem I have with this engine is that the timing gears, which actually uh, rotate or, or time the, the crankshafts, are two and a half inch diameter, pitch diameter, and that places the crankshafts too close together to get large enough counterweights to do the balancing. And so this engine would have a larger timing gears, the crankshafts would be farther apart, and I could get larger counterweights on there and be able to balance it uh, completely. Uh, before I, before I go to this engine, though, what I'd like to do is, pardon? Was there a question? Oh, okay. Well, before I, before I go to this, I think I'm going to try and lighten some of the components in this engine to see if I can balance it with the, with the counterweights that I do have. And if I can do that, then I probably won't build this engine. But if I can't, then I'll go on to this engine. And this, and this should be a nice engine, too. I've learned a lot from the earlier one. These are specifications for TESC002, and you can see that it's producing one kilowatt at 3,000 RPM. Uh, its efficiency is 25%, and uh, it's, uh, it'll be a little bit more powerful engine and better balanced. This is the power curve for this engine. And uh, at, different, at different charge pressures, 
what the power would be versus uh, engine speed. And now that's pretty much the end of this presentation. I've got what I call a gallery of Stirling engines. And this is uh, just a collection of engines, pictures that I've seen, engines that I've seen in different places. And it may be of interest, it may not. If, if people want to uh, see this, I can show this. If you have questions, I'll be glad to stay here and answer questions. You can come up and we can talk about the hardware. Uh, I'll leave it open to the people here. Yes. Ah, excellent. Excellent question. The question is, how is this funded? Right now, it's self-funded uh, from my retirement. I mean, you know, I'm spending my retirement money. Uh, I also do machine design work for customers. Uh, and up until this year, I tried to spend half the year doing work for customers to help fund this. Uh, this year, because I'm trying to get this engine done, it's, it's, it's been five years now that I've been working on it. I, I'm going to try and get through this year without doing any work for anyone else and just spending my time on this. And so far, I've been able to do that. But it's self-funded up to this time. Right now, we're in the process of writing a business plan. And next year, we'll be looking for either venture capital or investors. Uh, we haven't decided what direction we're going to go in yet. It looks like we're going to develop a product, probably a three kilowatt generator set, uh, emergency power type generator set. Uh, running on natural gas or propane. Uh, that's the plan right now. Uh, I'm getting worried about my retirement. Any other questions? Yes. The targets, the question is, is there a target selling price for the unit? No, because we really haven't set the specifications of the unit yet. Right now, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I'm hoping to design an engine that can be produced in large volumes for $250, a one kilowatt engine. Uh, these engines, as far as our, our initial production, uh, we're probably not going to produce in the volume of 10,000 units per year, probably maybe 1,000 units per year. And so they will be more expensive than that. Uh, how much more, I don't know yet. We haven't done the numbers. I need to go through and and do a part count and an estimate on, uh, on the part costs. And uh, that just hasn't been done yet. Uh, right now, I'm roughly estimating $8,000 for one of these engines hand built in lots of one or two. And I'm hoping that by the end of the year, I'll have an engine that I could offer for sale for in, in the neighborhood of $8,000. And, but that's really a research engine. It's not really intended to be a commercial engine. That would, there, there's a lot of demand from people who have applications that they're working on where they would like to have an engine that they could use. And uh, that, that would be the intent of those engines. It would probably only be 10 of those made in the next few years. But hopefully the other engines would, would come along. Uh, they'd be simpler than this. They might not be rhombic drive engines to keep the cost down. But uh, that's our plan right now. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, the question is, if you're building a heat pump or a refrigerator, would you eliminate the economizer? No, because the, the cycle, the thermodynamic cycle, is still the same. Even though the, the, the heat flow and the temperatures may be reversed or in opposite directions, uh, the economizer still functions in conserving the energy of the gas that flows through in that, in that the hot flow flowing into the regenerator heats the regenerator and gives up heat. And then on the reverse direction, it, it takes that heat back. And that's, uh, that's heat that you don't have to pay for with fuel or with mechanical energy input. Another question? Yes. Uh, the, the question is, what happened to the, to the recreational vehicle sterling generators, uh, specifically the Winnebago? I don't know. 
I don't know. I've heard that if you try to query Winnebago about it, they won't talk to you. So I think, I think it was something bad, and I'm not sure what it was. Personally, you know, the information that I've found says it was an 8 kilowatt unit, which to me seems pretty large for an application like that. Uh, a lot of the people that I talk with who want electrical power generators for homes, they're only talking about 3 to 5 kilowatts for a house. And so I'm not sure why that recreational vehicle would have one that large. And that might have been part of the problem. It may have been just the wrong engine for the application. Yeah, do you know how large they are? What, how many kilowatts? Oh, okay, well, maybe I'm underestimating that then. Yeah. I don't know, and I've heard other people ask or comment that no one seems to know. And, and that's another mystery with some of the Stirling engine technology. Uh, things like that GPU-3 engine that General Motors developed for the Army. Uh, it was successful in that it, it achieved its goals, and I believe probably half a dozen were built. Uh, no one seems to know where they are. Two or three seem to exist in museums. Uh, I've never seen one, but I've heard that, you know, there are two or three in existence. Uh, I got a letter from a gentleman in Canada one time who said he knew where several were buried somewhere in the United States uh, below the tide, but below the high tide level near some military base. And uh, he wanted to know if I was interested in going with him to try and salvage that, but I don't know. You never know what else is buried there, you know. <laughs> but... Uh, that's another mystery, uh, you know, why didn't, uh, why didn't it go into production or why didn't, uh, why didn't they get used, if not for that application, for something else? Uh, well, that's, that's possible. I'm not sure. I suspect that they were probably fairly expensive. Uh, the uh, Phillips Company and Ford Motor Company in the late 60s worked on an automobile, a Ford Torino, and I've got a book here with some pictures of that engine in there, and uh, I've heard that they spent a billion dollars developing that engine, uh, and it's, it was charged with 3,000 PSI of hydrogen, and you know, the thought of driving something like that around, you know, is pretty intimidating to a lot of people. And the fact that you have to be able to recharge it periodically because the helium's going to, the hydrogen's going to leak out, uh, kind of makes it, made it impractical, even if it was, you know, uh, cost-wise uh, available to people. That's true, and I think it's mainly because a lot of the applications, it was tried for the wrong application, and the automotive application is one of the worst, you know. And, and it wasn't really just Ford. Uh, General Motors did it. The Air Force did it. A lot of people have, have tried to build an automotive Stirling engine, and it, and it just hasn't worked out. Uh, but that's the application that most average people see or hear about, and so it's got a black eye for that. But I think something like a generator set is ideal. You run it, run it at constant speed. And nowadays, with uh, these inverters, the efficiency and the costs of inverters is getting to where you don't even have to worry about trying to synchronize to get 60 cycles out of your generator. You run it as a DC generator into an inverter, get your fairly clean 60 cycles out, and you can run your 110 volt 60 cycle appliances on it and not worry about trying to have some complex mechanism for controlling the engine speed. Sure. Right, especially if you could do it before uh, the first of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I've had quite a few phone calls yeah, related to that. Well, come on over. We'll put you to work. <laughs> yes. Yeah, a couple of years ago, Cummings Diesel was uh, working on a Sterling project. 
Yes, they were. Well, they just abandoned that, I think it was last year, I read in a publication. Uh, that was a solar application. And they were using a, I think it was a sun power engine. It was a four-cylinder engine with uh, a swash plate, I believe. And they, I'm not sure how many engines were built, and I'm not sure how much testing was done. Well, I think there was some concern about it. Either either the engine didn't meet specifications as far as power output or efficiency, or the whole system didn't. But there was some performance issue, I, I think, on it. And, and again, it's another thing that a lot of people don't talk about or don't know about, but everybody wonders about. Uh, but I did see a publication, a notice that said that Cummings was getting out of the Sterling business. And I'm not sure who has their their things now. I'm sure they still exist somewhere, and I'm not sure if it's being tested or, or what's going on. That's about all I can say, yeah. But they spent quite a bit of time and money on that project. Yes? Yeah, t uh, 200. Oh, the, the question is, uh, how much does General Motors afford a lot for the cost of an engine? In, in I really don't know, but those engines are not really comparable with, with the engines that I'm talking about. I'm talking about small engines, uh, 20 horsepower and under. Uh, so, in, and so I don't know if that would compare very well. I, I don't, honestly don't know what one of those engines costs to build. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Oh, the question is, how does the motor know uh, which end is going to be hot and which is cold? Well, it, you know, it depends on what direction you rotate the crankshaft in, and it'll either act as a heat pump or a refrigerator. And uh, it's basically because the, the, the thermodynamic cycle, again, where the expansion takes place, if the expansion takes place at the top, then that's the part that will get cold because as the gas expands, it cools. And then, then how, how it works is you expand that gas and it cools and it cools the metal around it, the heat exchanger, and then that gas is transferred to the other end and then, and then the gas is returned again, compressed, and then it's expanded again. And it's expanded every revolution, and it just takes, uh, uh, the saying is, it takes little buckets of heat from one end to the other. Any other questions? Yes. If you was to replace the working flow in that engine with The question is, if the working fluid, the air was replaced with helium, what kind of power increase would I expect? I'm not sure. I've no, I haven't done the calculations yet, but I would just from the seat of my pants, expect it to probably double or, or more. Uh, and, 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 and it's probably, it's hard to say because when you design an engine, uh, you design the engine for, to operate with a particular working fluid, and you can change the working fluid and, uh, to helium and, and get more performance out of it. But if it had been designed for helium in the first place, then it would be even more because uh, like the heat exchanger passageways, uh, the depth and the width and the length of the slots, are, are th that's three parameters that you trade one against the other and you, and you do these analyses in iteration and, and to see what happens to the power. Does the power go up or does it go down when you make a change? If you're using air as your working fluid, you'll get one answer. If you change it to helium, uh, a helium charged engine may want narrower slots in there because because of its thermodynamic properties than the air would, and so you'd get more, uh, uh, the engine would, would perform even better if it was originally designed for helium than if it was designed for air and just had the working fluid change. But there, in general, uh, the experience people have had is that there's a dramatic increase in power uh, when you put helium in, a especially at higher speeds. Uh, at low speeds, it's not, it's not as much 
uh, where you get into the, the, the higher speeds, then there's a, a more of an advantage with the helium and the hydrogen uh, uh, for these applications. You know. Any other questions? No questions at all. Yes. Uh, there was yeah. There has been talk, and there still is. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't used any yet. Well, I take that back. I've used some cylinder liners, or not liners, but coatings, which uh, they're proprietary coatings. You know, and they have these razzle dazzle names, but they're sputtered on, and they may be borderline ceramic. Uh, these low friction coatings, uh, I've I use one which is dichronite. Uh, I've done some testing with that. And in fact, there's a dichronite coated cylinder in this one. And that's a tungsten, tungsten, car tungsten disulfide, or I'm not sure. I forget what it is exactly. But it's supposed to be a low friction, uh, high hardness coating. And uh, does anyone know what it is? Okay. It, uh, it's supposed to help the cylinder wear and also reduce friction. I'm not sure if there'd be an advantage to that. Uh, the, the cylinder is, there's, there's not a lot of load or a lot of temperature on the cylinder. Uh, even the displacer, you put the seal down at the cold end of the displacer, so the hot end is really free. It's open and there's, there's no seal rubbing against it up there. Uh, some people have talked in the past about using ceramic burners where the combustion actually takes place within a porous ceramic and some people have had uh, uh, luck with that but then they've also had the disadvantage in that the, the ceramic tends to be delicate and easily damaged and uh, last I talked with people, that, at least the people that I knew that had tried it and they, they left it because of that reason. They, they just weren't strong enough to take the abuse. Yes. Uh, the question is, what's the temperature differential across this engine? It's roughly 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, the, the heater, the hot end, is designed to run at 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. And the cooler temperature, I like to keep it below the boiling point of water, so it's under 200 degrees. So there's about 1,000 degrees difference. Uh, in actuality, it's probably more than that, because at least with this burner, uh, the, the heater is running hotter than, than 1,200 degrees. Uh, I, uh, they, there's a thermocouple braze to the end of this uh, engine, and it's melted the braze material away and blown it away. It's, uh, the braze material is gone completely, so now the thermocouple is reading the gas temperature, and that gets up over 2,000 degrees. So I don't know what the heater head is doing right now. Yes? Oh, the cooler? Yeah. yeah I, is there any material that, that is almost non-conductive that, that would, you might say, separate the conductivity between the, the block or the heat or the wall? Okay, yeah. The question is, are there any materials uh, in the cylinder itself to help separate the, the hot and the cold sections from each other? Is that the question? Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. A, like a ceramic piece that's an excellent question. Uh, previous engines, and, and I've got a cylinder here from a previous engine. You can come up and take a look at that. And it's basically stacked up. There's the cooler, and then there's the regenerator and the heater. The regenerator and the heater are, are one piece. But uh, in the past, I had a separate, uh, well, there was a gasket between the regenerator and the cooler. And the gasket, uh, well, I tried a lot of different things, and, and one of the, the best things I found, I used aluminum foil. And, but then, even that, the cooler got too hot, and so I, I made a titanium spacer, which was only 50 thousandths of an inch thick uh, from a sheet of titanium. And the thermal conductivity of titanium, I think, is about half of that of stainless steel, and a third to a fifth, I guess, of aluminum. And this 50 thousandths uh, it looked like a gasket. It had the holes for the bolts and, and went on top of the cooler. And it had, a, again, the aluminum foil uh, on both sides of it. And I ran the engine and several times and did some testing and then took it apart. And the thermal conductivity of that titanium was so low that the aluminum on the hot side of it had actually bonded 
it got hot enough to bond to it, but on the cold side, the aluminum foil just peeled away when I, when I took it apart. It was a separate part. So just 50 thousandths of an inch. And I never measured the temperature difference across that, but it was impressive. Uh, yeah. Well Yes. Okay, I guess the question is uh, if there is any advantage to increasing the, the, the distance of that barrier or the thermal resistance of that barrier? Yeah, I'm not sure if there is or not. Uh, this engine doesn't have that barrier in it. In fact, it's got just the opposite. It's got a copper or, or an aluminum plate which separates the components and it's mainly there. It was, it was quick and easy to do at the time and I've considered going to a titanium plate. This one is a quarter of an inch thick and basically what it does is it just makes up for tolerances on all the other parts. When the, when the parts are all built and stacked together and assembled, there's that space in there which is used to make up the difference so I get the right clearances at the top and the bottom of the displacer and so its thickness would vary from one engine to the other and uh, right now I've been using aluminum mainly because it's easy to use but I'm thinking about titanium because again that that is a tremendous advantage to be able to separate that that those parts thermally and I think it it would be important in this engine to do that uh, as far as uh, things that might bypass that, that would basically be convection, I guess, air convection from the outside air, and, and uh, I don't think that's a significant uh, heat loss uh, through the air. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, the, quest the question is why haven't there been more commercial applications? And I think part of the reason for that is that some of these applications using, you know, automotive and everything else has sucked up all the money that could have been available for some of the other things. The other things aren't as glamorous. Uh, right now, the interest in, in generating electricity from alternative fuels, uh, people who want to be independent from the grid, uh, people who want emergency power, and people who want energy for uh, recreational vehicles. I think that's going to drive the need or, or, the, or the, it's going to drive the industry to where these engines become more common. Uh, I think it's happening all around the world. There are a lot more companies developing Sterling engines right now than they have been in the past. And I recently read where I think it was this year there have been over a hundred companies started just to build cogeneration systems. And they're not all Sterling systems. But it's the fact that all of a sudden cogeneration is becoming something that people want. And I think that Sterling would be a, a big player in that. Does that, that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I've got a view foil. Uh, Kokums, a uh, Swedish company. Let me, let me dig through my file here. Oh, in the meantime, here's one I promised. I promised I was going to show someone earlier. I'm not sure who that was. This is the steel engine. Uh, could I have a, a, the view foils, please? Oh, okay. Well, I'll do it myself then. Oh, here's, here's another good one. Yeah, this is a four-cylinder engine. It's kind of a unique design, and it's hard to tell from this picture. It's four parallel cylinders, and he's got uh, bevel gear drives. Each There are four bevel gears that run four different crankshafts that come out, so he can take power out in four different directions. And uh, this engine was developed probably eight or eight years ago or five years ago at least and he sells plans and kits for this engine so if anyone's interested 
Uh, his name is Ron Steele, and I've got his phone number or, or his address anyway that you could write to him and, and get his plans. Uh, I'm finding all kinds of good things here. Here's Jim Tangerman's boat. This was uh, two years ago at the harbor up near Half Moon Bay, and uh, we took it out on a maiden voyage, rode it through the harbor, and uh, had turned a lot of heads with that. And uh, do you want to say anything about it, Jim? It's a, uh, it's not, it's a gamma type engine, right? It's a gamma type engine. Uh, what about a six-inch bore? Yeah. Okay, and the stroke, four-inch stroke. And uh, we paddled through the harbor. It's a paddle wheel boat, and uh, we went through there at, what, about four or five knots? Well, see, i got to get an answer out of you somehow. We weren't pulling any water skiers, right? That's the next, <laughs> the next engine. Anyway, we're getting closer to the submarine, the submarine question here. Oh, here's another another boating related engine. This is an outboard motor built by Andy Ross. He's in Ohio and he's an engine builder, he's been building engines for years and does excellent work. There's a bicycle by him also. Did I Yeah, Andy Ross, and uh, I know I've got one here on the submarines. Uh, they're using the submarines. The Swedish Navy doesn't have nuclear submarines, and to extend the underwater range, they're using sterling power, and uh, they're burning fuel with liquid oxygen. This is some of the specifications, and... Uh, Oh, this says maximum shaft power is 75 kilowatts. Uh, maximum continuous rating is 65 kilowatts. Uh, the mass is 750 kilograms. Working fluid is helium. And uh, the height is 1.4 meters. And the length and width, or, you know, the length and width, uh, 0 0.8 meters. So it's not a real big engine. Uh, I've seen a video. Uh, where they took an existing submarine and they cut the submarine in half right here and extended it 20 feet and put this section in with all the sterling components and welded it back in and then launched it, relaunched it. And uh, that was pretty impressive to see. They I'm not sure. See, it's, it's, you know, it's an electric propelled submarine and the sterling is used to extend the underwater capability, they're saying, and to be able to run quietly. And so it is, so it is running an electric motor. It's probably used for both. Uh, they don't say what the fuel is. I suspect the fuel is kerosene or whatever they run in diesel engines, diesel fuel. And they're using liquid oxygen, they say, and I suspect that they're using the sterling engine running as a refrigerator to generate their own liquid oxygen so that they don't have to come into port to replenish it. Now, that's all speculation on my part, but uh, I suppose that's how I would do it. Uh, they claim that they have an underwater range increase of a, by a factor of seven with this Sterling uh, with a conventional submarine and not going nuclear. So it's worked out real well for them, and I think they do have several submarines converted now, and they're also, I heard, they're selling one, I think, to Australia and maybe one to Japan. And, yeah, okay, yeah. Any other questions? Uh, well, if we still have more time, I'm not sure who wants to leave, but we can probably find some other good things in here. Here's a generator set. This, this is, uh, <laughs> you're going to have to drag me out of here with a hook. Uh, this is a gentleman in Wisconsin. He's, he's a mechanical engineer, works for uh, Outboard Marine. I think that's what they call it now, uh, designing outboard motors. And uh, this is a project that he's done on his own. And uh, the basis of this engine, this is an alpha-type engine. 
The basis of it is a Chrysler uh, automotive air conditioner uh, crankcase, and he's added his own uh, uh, cylinders to the crankcase, but he uses the crankcase. It's got pressurized oil lubrication and its own crankshaft and everything else already designed for him and built. And uh, I think he said he buys, he can buy a, a compressor unit, a rebuilt compressor unit for $60, and uh, then the rest of the parts he makes himself. And this, I believe he's got uh, 80 watts out of this engine. He uses helium in this engine. And it's a very nice, very nice little engine. I've seen this run several times. He's in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. Uh, we'll see if we got something else really interesting here. Oh, this is a little engine. This was a little model that was built by a machinist. Uh, I don't know the machinist, but I know the present owner of this engine. And uh, it's, it's not a very large engine. There's a propane tank under here that fuels it, but it's, it's kind of a Rube Goldberg. And it's a, it's a, a gamma type engine. Uh, here's where the, the burner is and the stack. And he's got a flywheel flywheel is over here there's a radiator on the opposite side and he's got a water pump that pumps water through the radiator and this thing up here that looks like a governor is really a tachometer and the faster it goes the balls come out and it raises a pointer on a scale under here that uh, gives the speed uh, and it's a beautiful piece of work it's all brass and stainless steel and and uh, it's it's something to see run Uh, the question is, can you use geothermal power uh, for these engines? And I'd say yes. Uh, uh, the, 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 the overall efficiency of the engine is related to the temperature. And the greater the temperature difference between the hot and the cold, the higher the efficiency. All right. They will run at lower temperatures, and uh, there is an engine built that will run on half a degree centigrade. Uh, temperature difference and somewhere in here there's a picture of that engine it doesn't produce much power it's really a, a demonstrator engine and it and it's a, it's a good running engine the uh, the disadvantage with low temperatures like that if you want to produce uh, any kind of usable power is that the engine has to be large and that may not be a disadvantage in some places if you really just want to uh, generate power in a stationary uh, location, if you've got a lot of space. Uh, I recently did some calculations. I had a call. Somebody had some water that was almost to the boiling point, and I, th I think it was from a, a solar collector or something, and they told me how many gallons per minute they had, and I went through and did the calculations on it, and for 200 degree hot water temperature and say 50 or 60 degree cold end temperature uh, came up with an engine that would have a 15 inch bore and a 15 inch stroke uh, four cylinder engine and probably the size of this desk and maybe that's not a problem maybe it is I, I don't know again every application is different and I would say it could be done it's not going to be a very efficient engine because the temperature difference isn't high it would be a large engine because it's a low temperature engine but if it does the job, then it's the right engine for it. Yes? The, uh, the, the question is, what is the clearance on the sides of the displacer? And that is, a, that is an important factor. And the reason is there's, there's what's called shuttle loss. It's a, it's, a, it's a heat loss term. And as this displacer moves in the cylinder, there, there is a gap between the displacer and the, and the, uh, and the cylinder wall, and that space uh, can be a thermal loss if it's too large, or it can be a, a thermal loss if it's too small. And, that's, and it's something that is adjusted, and it's probably different in almost every engine. It's related to the speed, uh, the length of it, the, the length of the space, and Probably both. Uh, I know someone uh, as an engine builder there in California, and he's done it by cut and try. That's how he, that's how he does his, and and uh, and so he'll build three displacers. Well, what he do is he'll build one displacer with the smallest gap, run it, and do his take his test data, 
then he'll take that displacer and he'll turn some material off it and he can go back and rerun it. And then finally when he finds it, he's taken too much off and he goes and he builds another displacer. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, Jim Szymanski. Uh, any other questions? Yes. Uh, you mean the internet the address? It's uh, www dot tamen t a m i n dot com. You're welcome. Any other questions? Let me see if I can find that low delta t engine, and we can close up with that. Uh, oh, here's another. Here's another good one. We get distracted. Get distracted too easily. This is an engine that uh, Andy Ross did for a Department of Energy. Uh, uh, grant that uh, was an engine that would be run from a stovetop, and uh, he produced a little over 100 watts with this engine. Uh, I forget what the bore is. I think the bore is around five inches. It's uh, four and a half or five inches, and the stroke was about an inch and a half, and uh, that was intended to be used to generate electricity from uh, from a wood burning stove. Uh, Oh, here's a here's a model airplane, a model airplane engine. Uh, that's not easy to see, but this engine is flown on a radio-controlled airplane, and I've seen the video of that flight. That that probably happened 15 years ago. That's a Rob McConaughey engine. No, I don't. I don't have any of that. Oh, here's the low delta T engine. This is Jim Senth. He's a professor at the University of Wisconsin. I forget which campus it is, but he's, he's the person who actually uh, developed this type of engine. Uh, there's a person, uh, Ivo Kolen, at the University of Zagreb who did a lot of work in uh, low delta T engines. Uh, his engines tend to be the flat plate type engines that, that I showed earlier, that big rectangular displacer. And uh, he's got a lot of different configurations that he works with. And uh, evolving from that, uh, Jim Semp's engines uh, uh, work on that low temperature difference uh, uh, principle. And he's got, this engine runs on half a degree centigrade difference. It'll run in your hand, just the heat from your hand uh, holding it. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Is anybody ready for wine and cheese? Oh, I don't want to hear that. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've enjoyed this. Too nervous that I oh pick no, my I'm nose. Excellent, excellent. Pick my nose. I'm going to uh, close with a oh. our own promo. <coughs> Before we run out of tape, we're going to give a final promotion to one of our tapes we're offering through our website at exoticresearch.com. This is the uh, newly remastered version of a film that hasn't been available for a long, long time. It was Orson Welles' last movie. It's The Secret Life of Nikola Tesla. Long trotted in secrecy, The Life of Nikola Tesla is artfully illuminated in this fascinating film. Tesla, born in Croatia in 1856, is considered the father of our modern technological age and one of the greatest scientific minds that ever lived. He was an electrical engineer who changed the world with the invention of the alternating current induction motor, making the universal transmission and distribution of electricity possible. His achievements led to the discovery of radio and television as well as the development of the first hydroelectric dam, remote control, radar tracking for the military, and ma manipulation of matter and energy. His discoveries are also the basis for the emerging science of free energy. 
Encyclopedia Britannica lists Nikola Tesla as one of the most fascinating people in history. The Secret Life of Nikola Tesla, the movie, is a penetrating study of the life and mind of a scientific superman who, against all odds, dedicated his life to the task of designing and improving technology for the service and advancement of humanity.